recovery because we've been through... Oh, where is Governor Pete Obi? Has run away. You should go and bring him for me. I, I need to talk to him about a few of those. Go and bring him. I don't want to join issues with Governor Obi. He's an excellent governor and a patriotic Nigerian. But a few of those things he, he was reading are not quite accurate. Thank you. Don't run, sir. Thank you very much for retrieving Pastor Obi for me, um, Governor Obi. So thank you very much. So I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about the Nigerian economy and answer the questions that I know you've all been asking, but I won't join issues with Governor Obi, but I, every now and then I may stray, a bullet may hit him. But, um, <laughs> So, so it's all about building a productive economy, and it's really the road to recovery. But in order for us to understand where we're going, there are a few things I've got to be able to answer today. And that's about the past, the present, and the future. What happened? How did we get here? What happened? Everybody's asking the question. And we need to understand it, because to the extent that we understand it, we'll be able to build a future that will make sure we don't make those mistakes again. And what's happening at present? What is government doing? How are you solving these problems? I'll speak to that. And then what will happen as a result? Where is this future diversified economy? How, what does it look like? What does it mean for me and you? I'll also speak to that. So again, these are the questions you're asking. What happened? These missed opportunities that Governor Obi spoke about. Indeed, all the speakers and every economist, we're all pretty much, there's a consensus that Nigeria missed a lot of opportunities. And we need to understand why. And what, what are we doing? We're laying the groundwork for a more resilient economy and what's going to happen in the future. We're going to build an economy that really doesn't care what the oil price is. And it's extremely important. We cannot afford to behave like an oil economy. And I'll explain why. There are 180 million of us. We have 2 million barrels of oil a day. The Kuwaitis have 3.9 million people and 3 million barrels of oil a day. So we can't afford to behave like an oil economy. And what is an oil economy? An oil economy simply pumps the oil up and then they use the money, the dollars, to buy everything they need. That's the economic model that Nigeria had largely been following. We export crude oil. What is crude oil? Crude is unrefined oil. We don't even refine. And then we buy everything. In fact, we buy the same crude oil back. They refine it and sell it back to us. When I talk to people that are not as young and as uh, exposed as you, I say it's like exporting cassava and importing Gary. That's what we've been doing. We don't add value. We don't get any of the byproducts. They just give us the dollars and then we import everything. And what does that do? It means that Nigeria has become a very unproductive economy. The states come. I was a commissioner. Every month, all of us, 36, fly up to Abuja and we share. That's, that's the constitution. But that was not the intention of the Nigerian dream. The Nigerian dream was 36 states all producing, all productive. Now, what did oil do for us? It made us extremely lazy. It made so many businesses unpro un unprofitable. And in particular, because of the way we spent our oil proceeds, and I shall speak to that in, in, as we go on. Because the truth is, what we spent money on was the, were the wrong things. And that's the result we now have. There's always a lag. There's always a delay between action and effect. We are now suffering the effects of what was done two, three, and four years ago. And I'll show you why. Let's go to the next slide. Please. Next slide. Good. On the right, you'll see the average oil price before 2008 was $51. And we were doing okay, not brilliantly, but we were doing okay. We were pretty stable. We weren't growing brilliantly, but we were steady. And then the oil price suddenly shot up, which is the period you see, went as high as $120 a barrel. What did we do with that extra money? Maybe I should ask, what could we have done with that extra money? Well, if we had just fixed power, Nothing else, just power, wouldn't be in recession today. If we had just fixed roads, 
we wouldn't be in recession today. If we had just built a rail system, we wouldn't be in recession today. But what did government spend money on during that period? We weren't in government, by the way, but Governor Obi may know some of the people who were there. <laughs> Ninety percent, sorry sir, ninety percent of government expenditure was on what we call recurrence. What is recurrent? Salaries, travel, training, welfare. Welfare, by the way, is food. Welfare. That's what we were spending money on. Only ten percent went on capital. Only ten percent of government spending was on capital. Now, what is capital? Roads, rail, power, housing building educational institutions. Only 10% of government expenditure was capital. So that's, oh, I think I should pause as His Excellency arrives. No, I should keep going, okay. So only 10% of what we were spending was productive. Effectively, we were just wasting money. And I have many statistics that I can use. We were, in 2015, our travel, travel bill, travel was 64 billion naira, yes. But the amount spent on roads was 19 billion for the whole country, the whole federal government. Now, I was a state commissioner. In one year in Ogun State, we spent more than 20 billion on roads, just in our state. How can the whole federation spend 19 billion and we expect to grow? So, a lot of money was wasted. What else happened to that extra money? Please keep that slide, don't show me, slow the slide, it's very important. What else happened to that extra money? A lot of it was stolen. When the central bank governor at the time said, money is going missing, he was harassed. When the person who was supposed to collect your money, the banker, tells you that, please, your credits are not entering your bank account, you should take notice. We didn't, because things were still looked okay. Money was going missing. People were selling oil, diverting the proceeds. So when we talk about who's to blame, it's not about politics, but truth is, if we're to be very honest, it's all of us, everybody, that's the truth. When it comes to blame, we should always have a mirror. It's all of us. Those of us who heard that money was going missing and did nothing, those of us who heard money was going missing and didn't believe it, we're all to blame. And the consequences are what we are now.